today. But his life has been destroyed by the actions of those administrators. Personally, I probably this statement will get me into trouble. I believe that every general conference administrator who was party to that reaffirmation statement should resign immediately because they overstepped their authority with catastrophic impact on the lives of innocent Adventists worldwide. Amen. I think they should resign. Amen. They no longer have our confidence. So what are the implications? Well, it's difficult, to, it's difficult to talk about this because had the general conference said, with hindsight, we recognize we've made a mistake and therefore we want to, we want to recognize we made a mistake, want to apologize, how can we make this better? And let's make sure we don't make these kind of mistakes again. What has actually happened is the general conference issued a statement defined, defending their right to make such statements. We discussed that last night. And they have basically um, cancelled any and all possibility of any discussion about their authority to make that statement. After my appeal to Adventist Nobility Sermon in January 2022, the GC issued a, glo a global condemnation in Adventist News Network of any who would question their authority. To prevent any discussion at the 2022 GC session, the GC Adcom stripped me of my delegate status because they didn't want me to speak up and raise this question from the floor. When attorney Zirkel from California, from Loma Linda, made a motion to add the vaccine statement to the GC agenda in 22, Elder Wilson squashed that motion from the front. And you saw that last night. The Liberty and Health Alliance uh, put together a petition to the General Conference administrators. Almost 25,000 Adventist pastors, doctors, nurses, members worldwide signed that petition, and no response was ever given to that petition. When Pastor Wilson did a question and answer with members at the Granite Bay Church in February 23, over 1,100 members were present. And they were encouraged to type on their cell phones and type in a question. And Elder Wilson sat on the panel with a couple of other pastors, like Pastor James Rafferty from 3ABN and so forth. And the number one question, because people could vote for it, the number one question that was up on the screen the whole afternoon was why did the GC issue the reaffirmation statement that hurt so many Adventists? And for the entire afternoon, the panel refused to take that question, even though it had about 1,150 votes out of the people present. Essentially, our leaders are now hiding behind their lawyers. No discussion is possible, but we need a process of forgiveness, of reconciliation and healing to begin, and that requires courage on the part of all parties. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And it is incumbent, I believe, upon our GC leadership to recognize their role in what has happened and to make the first step to reconciliation with the members who've been hurt by their illegitimate actions. So over the years, I believe we have morphed. We began in the 1860s identifying as God's end time remnant movement in prophecy. As the remnant movement of prophecy, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. As the end time remnant people of God, we were fundamentally at odds with our wider environment. The USA was the second beast of Revelation 13, one of the end time foes of God's people. But over the years, we have morphed. Lest we talk about remnant church, we become a respectable church. We crave and receive tax exempt status, federal contracts for our colleges and our hospitals, subsidies and scholarships for our students. No longer are we fundamentally at odds with our wider environment. We've become fundamentally at ease with our wider environment. During the pandemic, when faced by huge social, economic, political, and media pressure, we morphed again. We didn't go back to becoming a remnant church. We ceased to be a respectable church. We became a regime church. We propagated the official lies. We canceled the truth speakers in our midst. We demonized our members who would not bow to the lies and we chased federal funding for our institutions. It's not easy to talk like this, but this is the truth. And for us to have healing in our church, we have to speak the truth in love, but we have to speak the truth. We became a regime church um, implementing the dictates of a godless government that has no place for God in its, in its deliberations, and we acted against our own members to preserve our, re our revenue streams and our institutions. This is nothing new. In World War I, the Adventist Church in Germany supported the Kaiser Wilhelm regime over biblical truth and the concerns of the members. We encouraged our young people to sign up to fight for the Kaiser, and we encouraged our members to work in the munition factories, including on the Sabbath. As a result of this, the SDA reform movement um, was born. 
In the USSR, the SDA Church supported the communist demand for young Adventists to enter the Red Army in 1928. We changed in 1920. We said that Adventists are conscientious objectors to military service. And in 1924, under pressure from Joseph Stalin's regime, at the all-Soviet SDA Congress, we changed our position slightly. So we said, now it's up to the individual conscience of our young men, whether they serve in the Red Army or not. And in 1928, the position changed again after further pressure from the Soviets. And the all-Soviet Adventist Congress voted um, to support and recommend our young men serving in the Red Army, as a result of which the underground SDA church began and they were called the True and Free SDA Movement. And they lasted almost 70 years as an underground Adventist movement, faithful to the Lord until the Soviet Union collapsed. In, the, in Vietnam to this day, 2024, the communist government expects ch- school children to attend school on Sabbath mornings. And there is in Vietnam today an official Adventist church who send their children to school on Sabbath morning. And there is an underground Adventist church, many times larger than the official church. And they refuse to send their children to school on the Sabbath mornings. Historically, when Adventism faces totalitarian demands, we have split. We have retained an official Adventist church that has survived the regime. We thank the Lord for that. But they have always yielded to the regime's unscriptural rules, and they've sacrificed our members and beliefs in order to save our institutions. We have also had a split where an underground Adventist church comes into being in the same country, and that underground church is true to Scripture. That's what has happened historically in Adventism. Now, time and again, when those, uh, those regimes fall, there is a process of reconciliation that takes place. And in some parts of the world, that reconciliation is more advanced than in other parts of the world. But some of these divisions between those who bow to the totalitarian demands and those who are faithful to Scripture and who are demonized by the official church, some of those divisions exist today around the world church. We may not be familiar with that too much in Maine, but as one who travels the world, I can tell you those divisions are still known by members who've gone through the trauma of a totalitarian regime. And I would say this uh, at this moment here, don't think for a minute that you know which group you would be in when totalitarian demands come your way. Nobody really knows how they're gonna respond to a matter of life and death. Nobody really knows how you would respond to the threat of a bullet from the KGB or the, or the, or the, um, the Gestapo. Nobody really knows. So as we look back on this history, Rather than saying this group is bad or this group is wrong or this group is good, we say, thank you, Lord, that I was not forced to make that decision myself. And by the grace of PTSD years and years after these events took place. But we, why am I talking about this again tonight? Because as I said last night, we are facing new totalitarian demands affecting all of humanity. The WHO is actively seeking via the international health regulations the authority to declare actual or potential pandemics, to issue mandates that override and, and um, override all civil and human rights, and to mandate vaccines globally. That's what they're openly and actively seeking for. And once they get it once, they'll never get, give up that authority. We are entering a techno-dictatorship a dictatorship of technocrats. The climate change industry is also seeking climate change lockdowns to be held on Sundays to preserve our common planetary home. Disease X, Mpox, uh, avian flu mandates and vaccines, these are all in our future. These are all being openly discussed by our political elites. And it won't be a surprise to you that the papacy actively supports the climate change lockdowns and the vaccination lockdowns. They support all of those lockdowns, not because they're particularly interested in your well-being, but because these initiatives cement a globalized technocratic dictatorship over all of humanity. They allow societies to accept the fact that you can override the convictions of the Holy Spirit on the consciences of individuals. Once we accept once, as in the last four years, that you can override your conscience, then it's easier for people to accept that in the next crisis. The papacy supports these initiatives because they help to usher in the final crisis of conscience and false worship that will precede the second coming. Now, when it comes to the climate change issue, the GC Adcom did issue a statement in December 95, 
for the, the, the dangers of climate change. It's an official statement. I wish they wouldn't issue statements because they don't age very well. Um, this is what they voted. It says the SDA church officially requested all world governments to, quote, take steps necessary to avert the danger. Quote, by fulfilling the agreement reached in Rio de Janeiro, the 1992 Convention on Climate Change, to stabilize carbon dioxide emissions by the year 2000 at 1990 levels, and by establishing plans for further reductions in carbon dioxide emissions after the year 2000. That last sentence is an open check to the world governments to do what they want for climate change, as far as our church is concerned. We have already signed up to whatever climate change initiatives are going to come our way. Therefore, it is not surprising that if you just change the word vaccination for climate change, that statement could be issued in the future where it says the General Conference is convinced that not vaccination but climate change programs that are being carried out are important for the safety and health of our members and larger community. Therefore, claims of religious liberty are not used appropriately in objecting to government mandates or employer programs designed to protect the health and safety of their communities. Once you've signed up an open-ended check to the world governments to implement whatever they want to do to restrict climate change, this is not a far, it's not beyond imagination, beyond reason to expect this kind of statement to be issued once again. And once again, our conscience is to be trampled upon. So, as I look at, we look at the, 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 of what has happened in the last four years, as I travel around the world, I see that we are facing a potential split along two lines in our church. It's, how it's come to the United Methodists, it's come to the Lutherans, it's come to the Presbyterians, it's come to the Episcopalians, and it's coming our way as well. On the one side, there will be Adventists who reject the GC Adcom's assumed authority over their conscience, who hold true to Scripture and our fundamental beliefs, and who thus who reject the onrush of cultural Marxism in SDA institutions and among our leaders, professors, and pastors. And it's more widespread than we like to admit. Then there'll be Adventists who accept the GC Adcom's assumed authority over their individual conscience, and either afraid to contend for the faith, the faith passed on to us, as per Jude verse 3, will actually support the abandonment of scripture in favor of cultural Marxism. And you'll notice there's a remarkable correlation between those who uphold the mandates and attack others who don't take the shots and those who support critical race theory, critical gender theory, LGBTQ normalization within our church, etc. There's a remarkable parallel between people who take one position and the other. So you might say, as I look at what's coming upon our church, that we're gonna to have to make a choice, each and every one of us. The church, when we talk about the church, we often mean the legal hierarchy, like the North New England Conference and the Atlantic Union, the North American Division, the General Conference. When we talk about the church as members, that's often what we mean. But the truth of the matter is, if the government of Maine were to cancel the registration, the legal registration of the North New England Conference, does that mean the Adventist church would cease to exist in Maine? Yes or no? no. Absolutely not. It means simply a functional unit that we, where we turn our tithes and offerings to, to support pastors and, and educators and so forth. That no longer exists, but the body of Christ still exists. It simply becomes an underground church, which means it has no legal presence. So what I see happening as a result of the last four years and the onrush of cultural Marxism across our institutions is this, that we're going to have groups of faithful and convicted Adventists on the one side and we're going to have institutional and cultural Adventists on the other side. They are, many of them are Adventists by convenience rather than by conviction. The Adventists on the left are independent of federal funding. The Adventists on the right, particularly our institutions, are completely dependent on federal funding for their institutions to remain alive. The Adventists on the left, the faithful and convicted Adventists, they uphold liberty of conscience. The cultural or institutional Adventists feel free to trample on liberty of conscience whenever financially or socially expedient. The Adventists on the left, the faithful and convicted Adventists, will one day establish when the mark of the beast is imposed an underground network of lay-led house churches. That's what we're going to be before Jesus comes again. The Adventists on the right, the institutional Adventists, will remain in a visible network of conference-affiliated churches and conference-owned buildings. The Adventists on the left, the faithful Adventists, will be able to preach and live the everlasting gospel and Bible truth freely because they have no, no fear of loss of having their church taken away from them by the conference or the government. The institutional Adventists, they increasingly self-censor the preaching of Bible truths if they happen to rebuke cultural Marxism. We see this in Canada today. 
where pastors are self-censoring in the area of human sexuality and marriage. Pastors dare not preach out biblical truth in Canada today, even many Adventist pastors, because if they do, the church will face a lot of um, hostile attacks from the Canadian federal government. So it seems to me that in Canada, we should already be going to an underground church in order to live and preach gospel truth freely and openly. We, we're, on the left, we have faithful and convicted Adventists who reject the acceptance of LGBTQ ideology and the normalization of this lifestyle within our church, the reposturing that some conferences want. And on the right, we have institutional Adventists who are increasingly accepting LGBTQ ideology and the normalization of this lifestyle. You might say they're no longer Seventh-day Adventists, they are Sodomite Adventists. On the left hand, you've got the faithful Adventists. They're focused on bringing the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, language, and people. On the right, we have our institutional Adventists who are focused on the preservation of our institutions, of our retirement funds, of the visible hierarchy and administrative incomes. On the left, the faithful Adventists, they seek the eternal spiritual benefit of individual members and non-members, no matter the cost. And on the right, the institutional Adventists, they seek the temporal, that is the, the earthly financial survival of our hierarchy and our institutions, no matter the cost. Now you may say, Pastor Wine, that's a very harsh division. But this is what I'm seeing happening around us. It may not be popular to say this, but this is what is happening. And in every one of our institutions that are supposed to be bastions of the Adventist faith, increasingly they are battlegrounds of the Adventist faith, where those who are upholding biblical truth are fighting a losing rearguard action against the onslaught of cultural Marxism within our institutions. This is the reality, and this is affecting pastors and educators across particularly the North American division. So this is how I see this is, this is where we may be going here in the North American division is very similar to the split that's taken place in the United Methodist Church, where you have the Bible Faithful Methodists that forms a new denomination, the Global Methodist uh, Conference that is affiliated with the Southern Hemisphere Methodists, and the, the remainder of the United Methodist Church in North America have now become essentially a woke ideological um, talking shop. And they'll probably go bankrupt in the next couple of years because their tithe base has collapsed. And so this is the, the, the pandemic merely revealed and exposed where each of our hearts are. They revealed whether we are willing to live according to our conscience and face loss because we believe in truth. And they revealed whether we are willing to accept the right to mandate on other people actions which go against their conscience or not. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody here tonight, but I am asking each one of us today to look, take a look at yourself in the mirror tonight and ask where we were in the pandemic. Now, and given what we now know about the official narrative that it was almost all a pack of lies, and it was known to be a pack of lies by those propagating it, and maybe it's a call for humility on each of our parts, and a recognition that um, God help us next time this kind of nonsense comes around, and that we're in this together as brothers and sisters, and whatever the divisions and pains of the past have been, let us work together with our brothers and sisters and say, look, the pandemic is over, and I can forgive you if you, and please would you forgive me. And if I, contribute, if I contribute to it, please forgive me and vice versa, because we are, more strong, we are stronger and we are more successful in mission when we are united together. And so we need to think of ways of how we come together and recognize the harms that were caused when people acted on the basis of falsehood against one another. The truth really does matter. The, <clears throat> so what do we do as Adventists? Well. This slide here is a slide that will probably get me into more trouble, but I put it up there. <clears throat> so the first thing is, what can we do as Bible faithful Adventists today? And the first thing I would say is, one option you have is do nothing. And recognize that the next time mandates come along, you're probably going to be thrown under the bus once again. And your livelihood, your career, your job, your mortgage, your home, your business, your marriage, your your custody battles will be sacrificed by our leaders to preserve their institutions, incomes, and status. That is not an option for any of us here tonight. The second option we have, and I would encourage you to do this, is to actively pray for our church leaders. Start praying for Elder Wilson. As I said last night and the night before, Elder Wilson is a champion for mission in our church. I believe his heart really is in the right place. But it's hard for one man to do something against the sheer inertia of all that divisions around the world. Pray for our world leaders 
that they will find the courage, no matter what the mainstream media may pressure them to do, to uphold liberty of conscience and to contend for the faith that has been passed on to us. You know, Jude chapter, Jude is only one chapter in it. The third verse, Jude chapter one, there's only one chapter. Jude chapter one, verse three says this, Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So we are to contend for the faith. If we do not contend for the faith, the faith will be overwhelmed by falsehoods. And so when it, particularly when it comes to our church leaders, um, when we elect church leaders and they work in conferences and unions and divisions, we do not pay them to go and do their job and go, go to their desk, write a few emails, sit in a few meetings, watch the trends that are happening and feel bad about what is happening, but say nothing in the committees, then go home and grumble to their spouse about what is happening. We don't pay our leaders to do that. We pay our leaders, as far as I'm concerned, with the tithes that we return. And I'm thankful we have leaders who do do this. We, we return our tithes so that our leaders in their sphere of influence on the committees where they sit, when appointment decisions are being made, when budgets are being allocated, when, when ethical and philosophical decisions are being made in the conference, I'm hoping and praying that our leaders will contend for the faith that has been passed on to them as well. That they will fight and defend the faith that we have, not just that we have as members, but our leaders will fight for and contend for the faith in their sphere of influence. It is not enough just to go to your office and come home after 40 hours and grumble to your spouse. You're in that office for a reason. Who knows But you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I thank the Lord for every leader who does stand up for what is right and true and proper. I would encourage you to pray for our leaders, pray for your conference president here, pray for your union president, that they will have the courage when those hidden moments, when decisions are being made that nobody sees, and there's a lot on the line, that they will have the courage to do the right thing. Pray for your leaders because they have impossible tasks. And when they know that people are praying for them, it gives them courage and it puts wind in the sails of that ship of state so the ship is going in the right direction. So pray for your church leaders. The third point there is more contentious. I put there, if the GC supports future mandates over the consciences of members, that's an important caveat. If the GC in the future supports future mandates over the consciences of mandates, I think we are well within our rights to establish a parachurch movement within the Adventist church. And what is that? A parachurch movement would be a gathering, a, a lay, lay, lay conference of lay, laity. They gather, they maybe incorporate, they return their tithes, that new lay entity that covers the whole of the North American division. And then the committee allocates that tithe to conferences who are faithful to scripture. And that way, the conferences that go woke will go broke. Very simple. And the members will determine where that tithe goes based on fidelity to scripture and whether they are willing to contend for the faith that has been passed on to us. Well, I recognize this is, a, when you touch the question of tithe, this is, the, this is the, the, the sacred nerve in the Adventist church. But Elder Wilson did say in his first sermon, hold your leaders to account. So we're going to hold our leaders to account. And if, if more mandates are imposed that override your conscience and the church throws us under the bus once again, I believe that someone somewhere will take the first steps to establish a parachurch movement. And we'll say with modern banking and modern legal systems, we don't need the conference union division GC hierarchy. We can collect the tithes ourselves and allocate them to the conferences that are faithful to scripture. It's a revolutionary idea. It's kind of crossing the Rubicon from many administrators' perspective but it's what we can do as members because we were encouraged to hold our leaders to account by our current GC president when he was elected. And this is about the only way we can do it. So this may well happen if the GC supports future mandates over the consciences of members. And the fourth thing, we're not there yet, is migrate to an underground house church movement led by bivocational elders and pastors. That's where we're gonna be when the mark of the beast is imposed. When the mark of the beast is imposed, the conferences cannot bank because they won't receive the mark of the beast if they're, if they're faithful to scripture. That means the conferences cannot employ pastors, they cannot employ teachers, they cannot receive tithes and offerings. Therefore, the conferences, when the mark of the beast is imposed, are basically history. So when the mark of the beast is imposed, we will be in underground house church movements led by bivocational elders who are elders and pastors of the same things in the New Testament. 
but we're not there yet in time. The mark of the beast is not here yet. We are stronger as a movement and more effective in reaching unreached when we work together. So therefore, I would appeal tonight, as I've appealed before to the church leaders, to that this annual council, this October, I know many of the church leaders will see this sermon. Many of you know that what happened was a profound mistake. So may the Holy Spirit give you the courage to rescind and apologize for the 2021 reaffirmation statement. It has been exposed to be a pack of lies. You took shelter in lies. Now you can stand for the truth. I want to appeal to our GC leaders to establish a fund to compensate Adventists who lost their livelihoods, like that young man in Australia who suffered catastrophic physical damage from the vaccines they were forced to take because of the reaffirmation statement. It just adds insult to injury that that which was mandated in 22 was banned by the Australian government because of those problems. It's ridiculous. It's truly ridiculous. So I want, I'd like to appeal to the GC to publicly affirm that in the future, they will defend the good conscience decisions of all Adventists vis-a-vis -vis any and all future vaccination mandates. If we do that, the whole world will hear about the Adventist church because we'll be the only Protestant denomination that stands for liberty of conscience when the next set of mandates come out. And the book of Revelation and the three angels' messages, fear God and give glory to him, those messages are given in the context of, of the mandates of the mark of the beast because the third angel's messages do not receive the mark of the beast. So the three angels' messages presuppose that you and I and planet Earth, everybody still has in that final crisis at least some liberty of conscience to respond in faith to God, no matter what the beasts of this world might do to them. So therefore, if we want to be known as the church, the movement that champions liberty of conscience, we can start today by affirming that we will uphold the conscience of our members vis-a-vis -vis any future vaccination mandates. And finally, to rehire any Adventists who are fired by the denomination um, for living in accordance with the convictions of the Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about this, I added another appeal. This is, um, there's a lot of text on the screen there, but let me just share what I'm saying. The US federal government is turning its back on God. As you turn away from God, you turn to Satan and his control. So the US federal government is turning now to its end time role as a war making, persecuting, conscience denying second beast of Revelation 13. We can see the second beast coming into effect before our very eyes. Even as we speak this year, 2024, satanic policies are being imposed by the federal government. As an example, the new Title IX rules on gender identity are affecting all the colleges in America. Now, the Adventist church cannot be a prophetic voice that God has raised her to be while she is financially dependent on the second beast of Revelation 13. Therefore, if we are to be the prophetic voice at the end of time, I would appeal to the Wilson administration to add to the agenda of the 25 session the question of divesting all institutions that receive federal funding uh, from the STA church. <laughs> sooner or later, as we heard in our Q&A today, sooner or later we have to get off that federal train. Sooner or later. If we don't get off that federal train, then the, the financial ties of that federal train will mean that our institutions will persecute our members when the mark of the beast is imposed. So we have been blessed over the years by our partnership with, with Medicaid and Medicare and, and all the rest of it. But that was when we had more of an ideologically benign government. We no longer have ideologically benign governments. We have ideologically driven federal governments. And sooner or later, this question has to come to the fore. And the pandemic is a great catalyst for raising this question. Sooner or later, we have to get off that federal train or we're going to implement federal mandates all the way through to the mark of the beast. So <clears throat> I've spoken a lot about other people here. This is my favorite quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. I, I, I have it printed out in the front of my Bible here. Many of you are very familiar with it. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right so the heavens fall. The quote goes on. But such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. 
A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and man. But the quote goes on. This quote is from the book Education. It is given under the prophetic inspiration for young people, not just old preachers like me. The, one, the greatest want of the world is the want of certain kinds of men and women who will not be bought or sold. This is a message for teenagers today, for young people. It's in the book Education. It's not in the book Councils to Ministers. It's in the book Education. So Sister White goes on to say, the youth needs to be impressed with the truth that their endowments are not their own. Strength, time, intellect are but lent treasures. They belong to God, and it should be the resolve of every youth to put them to the highest use. He is a branch from which God expects fruit, a steward whose capital must yield increase, a light to illuminate the world's darkness. Every youth, every child, has a work to do for the honor of God and the uplifting of humanity. So this is the counsel we've been given. And if you're a young person sitting here tonight, don't think that people such as Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King, they didn't appear overnight. Elijah and Moses did not appear overnight. God shapes and fashions you in your younger years because he knows the moment when you are coming into the kingdom for such a time as this. He knows the moment when you are going to be the tip of the spear for the kingdom of God. He knows the moment when you're going to be called to answer for the faith that you have within your heart and your mind. And he knows when you're going to have to contend for the faith despite the opposition of all around you. And so I'd encourage you as young people, and those young people watching online, the character that we read about here, the greatest one to the world is the want of men and women will not be bought or sold, etc., etc., who will stand for the right that the heavens fall. You can have that character by the grace of God as well. It is not the result of accident. It comes through self-discipline or the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the subjection of our physical desires and our, and our fallen desires and our, and our carnal nature for, our, for, the, for the, the overriding rule of reason and conscience in our lives, the surrender of self for, for the service of love to God and to man. It's my prayer that each one of us We'll cooperate with the Holy Spirit from this day forward. Amen. We'll cooperate with the Holy Spirit and he will bring to completion the good work that he's begun in each one of us. So when that final crisis comes, you and I will be found in this group here. Men and women who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Men and women whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Men and women who do not fear to call sin by its right name, who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Cooperate with God. Be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Be obedient to the promptings of the Spirit in, your, in his word and, and in his con and in your, upon your conscience. And God will develop a character in you that is fit for eternity. Let's bow our heads and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you allow us to go through these troubles. I thank you, Lord, that no trouble has come upon us, but you give us the grace to get through it. I thank you, Lord, that when you allow troubles to come our way, it's a vote of confidence that you've got this. And Lord, we've all got war stories, what's happened in our past. But Father, I pray that in these days of camp meeting, in the coming weeks and months, that you will so refine and shape our characters that we will be heroes of faith in earth's final hours. Father, I pray that we will put away the gods of this world. I pray that we will wash our minds every morning through the water of the word of God. I pray that we will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We will ask for it and receive it each and every morning. I pray, Lord, that when that final crisis comes knocking on our doors, we will be ready for that moment, not because we are strong, but when Christ is in us, who can stand against us? So, Father, from this day forward, may there be less of us and more of Christ. Refine us, shape us, give us victory over the sins that beset us. May we run the race that is set before us. May we fight the good fight of faith. Uh, may, we, may we run the race that is before us and may we keep the faith. And, Father, when you come on the clouds of glory with your Son, Jesus Christ, 
we humbly ask that you're coming looking for each one of us. Until that day, Father, may we be faithful, may we be strong, may we be loving witnesses for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.